Now we're back. We're live for the four o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. I love doing this. And I love doing <laughs> it with Ian Lynn, too. He's a reporter's reporter, investigative reporter. What a guy. I admire you so much, Ian. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Always we're fun. going to talk about the uh, evidence coming out of the Miskey case. The, that's the Michael Miskey case. Michael, Michael Miskey case, Jr., as I recall. He's a junior. That's correct. And uh, <clears throat> he got into uh, some trouble with um, G organized crime and a whole crime ring using his uh, Kama Aina termite company as a cover. And um, they got him. They got him and they're prosecuting him. And the prosecutor here is, uh, is Kenji Price, a, a Trump appointee, but a, a terrific <clears throat> prosecutor, good experience and motivated. And you've been covering it in a number of stories. Uh, so can you give us uh, the thread about what's going on in that prosecution? Well, I'll try. Here's the quick once over. Um, in, it was in July of 2020 that FBI agents raided a house in Kailua at 4 a.m. And uh, along with several other locations in Honolulu, they arrested Michael Miske, owner of Kamana Termite, Kamana Plumbing, and a host of other companies. Um, they, in, they were indicted on a 22 count indictment um, the, the, broad, the broad umbrella is a charge that they were part of a racketeering conspiracy. Um, there, are, there are 11 defendants, 10 of them are alleged to have been part of this racketeering conspiracy. All of them were then alleged to have taken part in one or another of a series of serious crimes that are charged in this indictment, ranging from murder for hire, kidnapping, um, armed robbery, uh, bank, bank fraud, uh, you name it, it's in there. Drug, extensive drug dealing um, from methamphetamine and cocaine to opioids. Um, there, there are four capital offenses, I believe, that uh, Mike that Miski is charged case. with. That's a potential capital punishment case. The government has not decided whether it's going to pursue that Hawaii is a state without capital punishment and it's would pose political problems. Um, but anyway, that's the seriousness of the charges. So, well, let me just uh, offer a thought about the, the environment for all of this, you know, Hawaii, sure. low crime rate, Hawaii people follow the rules in general. Uh, Hawaii doesn't have, or it hasn't had in a while, any organized crime uh, that I know of. Um, and um, here's an, organized crime ring happening in our midst and doing the worst things that organized crime, I mean, arguably, allegedly, the worst crimes that organized crime does right here, right here in Hawaii. That's very, that's very threatening. And especially at a time when at least the uh, county prosecutor, city and county prosecutor and its office was in a black hole for so many years under the <clears throat> Kehaloha, Kehaloha scandal and prosecution. So here we find that, uh, I guess it must have been the FBI investigated um, and maybe other agencies too. And we find that the prosecutor is finally prosecuting. But we know what, it, what it tells me is that um, um, this has got to be a series of crimes, uh, those 22 indictments that have been taking place over a long period of time. And we really didn't know about it. They, <clears throat> the government alleges that the overall conspiracy directed by Mike Miske has been going on since the late 1990s. And if that's so, it would have been with a succession of, of partners or associates he worked with. Um, much, what I see this, this case as is an opportunity of, to open a window onto what is the state of organized crime in Hawaii. Um, it's something that only comes along maybe every 10 years or even more, there's a big federal case like this. And you know, they go in and they, we, we, we get a trial and we get to see uh, the evidence been, that's been collected that tells us what's been going on in that last decade. And this is our, this is our chance for this decade. I don't, <clears throat> clearly these things were going on. We just didn't know about them. Um, and one of the, the problem is that local police and local prosecutors they're dealing with a crime's committed, the police are called, 
um, someone is arrested, they sent to the prosecutor, the prosecutor decides if there's the evidence, if there is, they go to court. Whereas the federal government can look and say, here's a problem, let's investigate it. Let's see who the players are, let's take our time. In this case, this investigation has been going on a minimum of six years. Um, I believe it had to have been started by around 2014. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the course of that, the government recently disclosed they have collected and turned over to the defense attorneys now 450 gigabytes of digital files um, and some 30 something DVDs containing um, recordings, video recordings, audio recordings, wiretaps, um, photos, and so on. So it's a, a huge accumulation of evidence they've made in the course of this, of this investigation. And they've alleged, many things are alleged in the indictment, but are not charged. Um, things like extortion, money laundering, um, uh, employment fraud, um, you know, paying people for fake, for not doing jobs or paying people with cash to avoid taxes, um, a whole slew of offenses, as I say, that are not charged, but are alleged. The whole so this, enchilada, this is, why would they allege them but not charge them? Uh, I'm sure it's because they don't need to. They have the serious ones, the ones that are gonna count, and the other charges would just uh, be wasting their resources, I guess. But they'll, I assume they'll use them to show the pattern of conduct um, in this case, much of it violent conduct uh, undertaken by this group of people un uh, allegedly under the direction of Mr. Miski. So does of this course, cut off the head of the snake? I mean, let's assume, and I, and I do want to explore it step by step, but let's assume that um, this puts them out of commission, closes them down. Does this, this um, alleviate the problem for the community or, or uh, does this suggest there are other organized crime rings out there that are doing the same thing? Well, you know, Hawaii is a town where there's a lot of money flowing around, sloshing around in various private and public projects. And I just don't think that um, you get that concentration uh, of resources without someone figuring out a way to make a, a quick buck or an illegal buck off of it. So no, I think it could change the picture for a while. It's probably put a crimp in the drug supply for a while, but it, you know, just like previous drug bus, major drug bus here, um, it doesn't put an end to the drug problem. The other thing it seems to show is that, is that one of these things go with the other. In other words, if I find that there's drugs, for example, I'm going to find all these ancillary crimes, like the <clears throat> murder for hire, and um, you know the, the, all the fraudulent stuff that was happening around. Um, it, it's never just one thing. When you talk about organized crime, you're talking about all kinds of uh, ancillary other crimes. Am I right? Um, yeah, and traditionally, uh, this the current case is somewhat different from traditional Hawaii organized crime. You know, traditionally, what did you have? You had crime groups that controlled prostitution, they controlled gambling, they controlled drugs, and then they fought over what territories they would they would hold. <clears throat> in this case, there's no evidence in the record so far that the Miski group was involved in prostitution or involved in gambling, except in um, they were the government alleges a series of cases in which they um, attacked the operators of gambling operations, gaming rooms or, or gaming uh, pro activities and made off with their money. Um, they also attacked other drug dealers and made off with money. In one case, allegedly with uh, five pounds of methamphetamine that they took and then split up and sold as their own. So it's a, it, it, it's not a traditional group and, and it's untraditional in the sense that his companies were well known, right? Every your newspapers came with it, um, wrapped around the newspaper or in your midweek and comma Ina termite. Everyone knew it, um, and yet the government alleges that behind that they used the company both as a headquarters for their criminal activities, but also to provide, for example, in one case, um, 
The government specifically alleges that one person got out of prison, was working for Miski, <clears throat> had to report to his probation officer or parole officer. And so they jimmied up uh, fake paychecks to show that, oh yes, he's employed and working here and where he was really doing was furthering the work of the, um, uh, this conspiracy. Mm. So what kind of a crowd do we have here? I mean, uh, are you able to say what brought them together? What, what uh, were they high school chums? Uh, <clears throat> how do they know each other and where do they come from and who are they? Well, the core is really, Miski, Miski's father died when he was only six. And he went to live with his um, mother who was local. And they, they ended, family ended up in Waimanalo a bunch of relatives are in Waimanalo. And as a young man, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old, um, he had, he was arrested with uh, one cousin, another cousin was sent away for 25 years on drug charges. Um, the, or, the organization that's been charged includes one brother. <clears throat> it includes uh, several cousins, um, uh, um, uh, someone who was married, formerly married to his aunt. Um, so there's a lot of family relationships in here. But then also, you know, he worked, he lived on the streets um, as a young man, um, came from, came out of Waimanalo, lived on the streets in Kailua, got into trouble there right away, was a, a repeat offender as a felon before he was 21. Um, so how old is he now? He is about 40, 47, some, about, I, I don't, off the top of my head, I can't say, but I think it's about 47. And was he yeah. the founder, the uh, organizer of the, of the termite company? I mean, yes. is that his company? So that is I, his, his company. He, while out on probation um, in the late nineties, he got a job with another termite company, Oahu Termite Company. He was a kid. He learned the business apparently from Oahu Termite. And when his probation was up somewhere, um, it's still not clear where, he got the resources to start his own termite company, which he did. And in pretty short order, uh, turned around and began trying out other companies. So I, I say he must have a list of 15, 18 companies that many, most of them started, never went anywhere and closed. They may have been fronts for something. They may have been, um, you know, hiding transactions for one particular deal. But most, so most of them faded away, but um, the termite company stayed and the plumbing company is still alive. Actually, his businesses are dead. They've lost their licenses. Their businesses are closed. Their business records were seized by the federal government. They're not coming back. Um, but the, but many of the, some of the people involved who ran those companies, they are still licensed and in business. You know, one of the issues uh, you, you mentioned, and which was uh, in the last article I saw that you wrote, is this whole thing about how the government may turn over its evidence to the defense, which it has a legal obligation to do, but not to the media, not to the public. Um, can you talk about that? And what's the balancing of equities on an issue like that? Well, um, eventually, as I'm learning now, researching related cases from the past, uh, eventually when these cases go to trial, a lot of evidence becomes available. Um, and some of it will, will leak out in other ways along the way. And, in this case, what we're seeing now is the federal government has spent the last um, three or, well, let me, let me back up. Originally, this was a drug case. There was a first indictment um, in 2019, a year before the indictment when he was arrested. That first indictment charged simply Mike Miske and one other person with um, financing a major drug deal Allegedly, he put up $400,000 to buy about 20 pounds of cocaine in California and bring it back to Hawaii. <clears throat> that indictment was kept secret. That indictment was then used, though, to begin to work on other people who were part of his drug network. 
and they've, the government has now produced at least four, five, I think maybe five people who have now pled guilty on drug charges originally, and then um, they have entered into plea agreements that uh, recognize their role in his criminal organization, broader criminal organization. And at least, at least one of those people had been, had been arrested in 2005, served 10 years or so in federal prison, got out, got a new job with Mike Miskey and was given a lot of work to do, including uh, attempting to organize and arrange the murder of several people. Um, only, only one of those people was murdered, in fact. Um, but he has now turned state's witness and reached a plea deal just a month ago uh, to testify for the state. So that's, they've been very busy at finding people all the way up the chain from lower street level people to middle dealers to top level people who had access to him and can testify about Miski's own um, conduct. Just like in the movies. Just like in the movies. You try to flip the witness. And you start at the outer circles and work your way in. And that's what they've done very successfully so far. And they imply, the government implies there are more um, people who have not yet been identified who, who well testify, who have and well testify. So that, that is one of the considerations, I suppose, in the balancing mm -hmm. of, the, of the equities on whether to reveal the evidence they have accumulated with the media, with, with the, pre, uh, with the uh, public. It uh, seems to me that, that would militate against distributing it, uh, publishing it, because then they, they're not able to follow that track of flipping witnesses. Am I right? Right. We're pretty far along now. At this point, um, information has been buried in you know, relatively obscure court filings. I mean, there are filings in this case and in related cases <clears throat> in which the government um, gives some details about a number of these episodes, both things that are charged and things that are not charged, but are alleged. <clears throat> and in those documents, where I, it's where I've found things. You know, I started um, just looking up anybody he had associations with in court cases going back 10 or 12 years. And that's what brought me to finding the people who've been flipped in the last three years, getting arrested on drugs and then worked into confessing their role in the, in the Miskey organization. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned is, uh, I don't know, it's troubling, I think, <clears> to <throat> just a, an outsider, a, a John Q. Everyman, is this thing about murder for hire. And I wonder how, how that works here in Hawaii. I mean, there have been strange murders over the years, and I'm sure that murder for hire is, is not a complete stranger of the Hawaii criminal community. But um, I just wonder how that works. For example, you what? You offend somebody. You get into a bad deal with somebody. You owe some money and didn't pay it. And then um, and somebody hires somebody like, like Miski or allegedly uh, doing the things Miski does. And um, he goes after you and uh, tries, to, tries to murder you with impunity. I mean, who, who are the targets of this kind of activity? Well, in his case, um, the government has disclosed one target was someone who he suspected of being a government informant. And in that case, several people armed hid outside the person's house waiting for him to come out so they could kill him and he didn't come out. <clears throat> and then after that, for whatever reason, it was not pursued. And we don't, you know, we don't know why. Another case was um, in the news uh, in the last, well, actually last summer, uh, Lindsay Kinney, um, uh, who had worked on the movie sets where Miski also worked and several of his other insiders worked. Uh, in this case, he, Miski allegedly approached Lindsay Kinney to kill uh, Jonathan Frazier, who was the, his son, Miski's son's best friend. They were both in the car that crashed in November 2015. Miski's son eventually died four months later of injuries from the crash. Jonathan Fraser survived. <clears throat> Miski, with no evidence, in fact, counter to all the evidence that was available, alleged that 
Jonathan Fraser had, had been the driver of the car and thence was responsible for his son's death. Alleg the government alleges that as a result, Miski arranged or paid for his, mur his kidnapping and murder and the disposal of his, of his remains. Um, at least that's, that's the allegation. Um, the others, um, they, they cite, I think it's three other cases where there are no details have been provided so far about who these were that had been targeted to be killed. I suspect most of them at that point were, um, were people who he suspected were helping the government and in, in putting their case together. <clears throat> they're, they're, the government records show that um, since at least 2015, the end of 2015, around the same time his son had this car accident, there was already active federal um, pursuit of him. Um, by 2016, he had, he hired a high high powered defense attorney, and in court filings, um, her attorney has claimed that his banks were were saying they weren't going to do business with him anymore. Apparently, because the government was subpoenaing records, um, the IRS was part of the investigative task force. I involved the IRS, the ATF, um, drug, drug agents, drug enforcement, um, and FBI, and who else? Uh, I'm sure there's somebody, uh, uh, Homeland Security. So it's, it was, it's been an extensive um, investigation, but here we, here we are. Um, well, where, where are we, Ian? I well, mean, so evidence has been accumulated accumulating uh, and they witnesses continue have been accumulating uh, at some point there's going to be a trial where are we on the continuum to that uh the trial because of covid what has been post continued until i believe it's september of this year but you know that's not going to happen everything else is backlogged um this is going to remain backlogged as well um <clears throat> there recently there's been a a, a skirmish over how much access Mr. Miske should have while he's in the federal detention center to computers and other things that um, his lawyers say he needs in order to review the 450 gigabytes of, of uh, records um, to assist them, assist in his own defense. Um, that, that skirmish is still ongoing. And that would delay the trial anyway, even if COVID didn't. Yes, yeah, it's just, it's a mass, a massive complex prosecution um, that must just be put, put real pressure on the defense attorneys to, to cope with the, all its angles and all its uh, uh, factual allegations. Well, <laughs> uh, sounds like uh, he has, Miski has enough money to hire high high price attorneys and uh, they can handle it and they will weather the storm i suppose in the end and go through the trial is there any suggestion to the commentary to the contrary yeah um when when he was arrested and they swept in they they confiscated the business um bank accounts as well as his personal bank accounts there's been nothing in the record yet about which personal accounts might have been released to him, except there was a discussion of his uh, and money in an escrow account from the sale of one property, um, which would net him a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Um, but apart from that, it's, it's unclear. The government says that he must have lots of money at his disposal. It sounds like though they haven't found all of it, mm. right? They've, but, but they have closed down his businesses where much of his money was. Um, so it's, it's unclear how much, how much remaining. He still has a house that's worth six or seven million dollars um, and a number of other real properties that are in his name. It sounds like he's got resources left to fight with this. And on the government side, um, you know, I, I recall uh, in, the, in the stealth bomber case, I don't know if you covered that at all back about um, 10 years, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. This fellow stole the plans for the U.S. Uh, design of the stealth bomber to China, and he actually never got paid. We had the prosecutor on Think Tank, and he told us the prosecutorial, you know, uh, view of all of that. It's very interesting. 
but one thing was clear is if the United States attorney wants to go after you, he has unlimited resources to do that. He has all those agencies that worked on the investigation. He may right. have an assistant U.S. attorney that is brought in just for the trial from Washington, whatever. Um, and uh, he can spend as much time as he needs to. It's, it's not the same as a defense counsel. Right. Now, one of the things that is unanswered and disappointingly so, um, I was one of those who hoped and saw hints that it would happen that, that this prosecution would disclose the relationships between those in political and, and social power in town and groups like Miskis operating below the surface. And as I say, there have been hints that along the way that there were these ties and these relationships with the Kealohas, for example, but none of that is yet in the record or any hint of that in the files. So whether there will be a new superseding indictment that takes us farther into the heart of that political world or not uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, well, I mean, just following the, the movie culture on it, uh, it's likely if you have a, an enterprise of any magnitude, you have to buy off some politicians to protect yourself. You may find it, and you may not find it until the last minute because I'm, I'm getting from this discussion that the government does not have to disclose indictments they can be secret, essentially, no? They can until, until they're actually acted on. Yeah. Right. So, so um, you know, this all reminds me, and I wonder if uh, you covered it at the time, of the Rothman ent enterprise back hmm. uh, 20, 30 years <clears throat> ago. Uh, uh, before my a... time. <laughs> <laughs> As a reporter, at least. Okay. <laughs> but you remember the case I'm talking about. Oh, yes. So what's what's the Fast comparison? Eddie, huh? Yeah, what, you know he was doing a lot of stuff, Rothman. I don't know what happened to him. But he Apparently, he's alive and well on the North Shore. I'm told. Did, did he escape? <laughs> did he escape prosecution? Um, serious prosecution. He's not like like uh, some of Misky's friends who have gone away for the long term. Yeah. So, so. at a trial of this nature. It sounds to me like um, these, these witnesses who have flipped, they're gonna be testifying. Um, and it sounds like um, there'll be a lot of witnesses. It'll be, uh, you know, months, a months long trial. Sure. And it'll, it'll be a tedious yes. process and the jury will be a federal jury impaneled on it. And they'll be told that they're gonna to have to spend months listening to the evidence and, and so forth. Um, that is a major, uh, major experience, isn't it? We don't have too many trials like that. We don't, no, we don't, and you, for obvious reasons. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it's a, organizing it both for the prosecution and the defense is, is just a horrendous job. Even just explaining it. Like, it's very much like the Kealoha case. Their original mailbox case went on for a long time. This is gonna dwarf it. Yes, yes, and, and it's much more serious because it involves capital yeah. crimes. Yes. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, uh, from a political point of view, Kenji Price is a Republican. I believe he's a good uh, U.S. attorney. Um, and um, the, the likelihood is, I don't know if you've studied this, but likelihood is that he'll be replaced with the new administration because that's usually right. what happens. It's very rare that an incoming administration, uh, you know, stands by the appointment of the previous administration, especially when the, right. the parties are different like this. So right. it'll be someone else. Uh, and my guess is, well, likely it'll be somebody from this community and uh, may not be the same kind of personality as Kenji Price. I don't know if that is likely to change the zeal with which the US attorney approaches the case. Any thoughts on that? Well, in this, you know, Kenji Price is the administrator up at the top. He's not one of the U.S. attorneys handling the case. So I, all those people, those people aren't political appointees. They stay in place. They're doing their jobs. I think whoever comes in is going to ride that horse to the end. You know, there's, it's too far gone. It's too far into the public domain right now for it to be dropped. From a career point of view, it seems to me like a case like this is, is really um, a critical case for the careers of the individual prosecutors who are involved. Uh, mm -hmm. And, they, and they, they will make or break their careers depending on the results here. It's important for the careers that they, 
they win and to say, um, you know, I don't know what winning is in a case like this, but that they arguably win. Well, I'm told that in federal court, the defendants rarely win. It's by the time it gets to trial on a federal case, um, 95, 98% of, of people are convicted if they haven't already pled guilty along the way. So, um, you know, trying to beat a case like, case like this is gonna be difficult, especially for the central players. There may be some of the people who are more peripheral in the group who, who, who could, you know, they could walk away. But I don't, I don't see any of the any of the central players, you know, unless there's been some t some huge mistake that is not obvious. Um, it's going. I mean, it's not going to be good news for anybody um, sitting in that courtroom. Yeah, and what about um, you know the possibility of um, copying a plea here? Uh, my guess is that the government is not <clears throat> likely to do that if it has a good case. It's not going to. It's not going to entertain those negotiations. Is that is that possible? Has it been discussed? Is it is it on the horizon? Oh, I think they'd very much like to avoid having to go to a complicated trial if they could get everybody to plead. And I mean, at least the rumor mill says they've been trying to get Miski himself to flip against someone higher up than him. And I don't know who that would be, but um, you know, rumor mills full of that talk. And whether that's true or not, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But, it's but you know, they have flipped uh, several other people, including some who were clearly potential defendants in this case. And there may there may even be some among the defendants named in this in, this indictment who have agreed um, to testify at a future date. That's the government um, says that may be the case. Well, you know, if they can use him to flip against someone higher up on the chain, or maybe a supplier, maybe the supplier of the 20 pounds of cocaine from California, um, maybe uh, somebody, some politician who took money from him, whose name has not come out yet, uh, right. you, go up, you go upstream, right? Right. But in this case, you know, um, getting, getting something in return is not going to mean anybody's going to walk. It means someone might only get 10 years instead of 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking relative, um, relative benefits here. We're not talking freedom. Any chance of a pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, you know, I doubt it very much. I don't think he's on that list. No, I don't think so. So in the federal, in the federal criminal practice, usually the judge is assigned at the outset and in the federal system, and he stays, he stays on the case throughout from the beginning to the end. Who's the judge? Who's the judge in this case? I think these are going now to uh, Judge Watson. Um, so they, they have made some, they, they did change a little bit along the way and some things have gone and, and much of it's still at the magistrate's stage at this point. Um, there's still, there's still you know, the pretrial things that are down haven't come up to the judges yet, filtering their way up. Right, you have the magistrate ma makes all the evidentiary rulings and, and discovery right. rulings and so forth. Right. And so you've been covering this uh, over a period of time. How long have you been covering it? How many articles have you written? What, what aspects of it have you covered? Ooh, um, well, I started following Miski several years ago when someone called me and said he was lighting up a tree in Hawaii Kai and it had the Hawaii Kai residents up in arms or some Hawaii Kai residents up in arms. <laughs> that was my first introduction to him. Um, I started, you know, the, because there was a potential crossover to the Kealoha case, which I'd also been following carefully. Um, I started digging into this one as soon as indictments came down. I counted recently, I think I counted 38 articles or blog posts um, describing some aspect of this case. Wow. Uh, you know, just peeling away, trying to explain what's happening and what's happening in court or what's happening in the evidence. Um, and still trying, to, I'm still trying to go back and look at the growth of his business empire, how he could have financed this, um, whether there's evidence of in the in his real estate career, for example, of money laundering, you know, the 
often it would be the case with uh, real estate transactions. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff to dig into, some of which, some of which I'll, I'm holding my ammunition for later. <laughs> well, later means that you'll keep uncovering it. My, my guess, uh, you know, from the point of view of what we discussed and the track of this, you know, the points that have come out into the public here, it gets more interesting all the time. And yes. when you get to a trial, it's going to be really, really interesting. I mean, so I, I can't imagine you not continue, <laughs> not continue to come. What else am I going to do in my retirement? <laughs> <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> exactly right. So, okay, I, you know, just to go back to the, the principal thing, is how worried should we be about this sort of thing? It strikes me that the, the murder of his son's friend is very troubling um, because it's a vanity murder. It's without any good reason uh, and all the worst <clears throat> reasons. And it means if he doesn't like the way you, this kind of criminal, if he doesn't like the way you part your hair, uh, then he could be sending people after you right here in Hawaii. Uh, I, I call it vanity because it, it doesn't base, it's not based at, in, in any reality. Um, and so you wonder if that kind of thing exists and we should all be a little concerned, you know, uh, like not getting into arguments with the wrong people, that sort of thing. Well, I guess if I had known some of these people, I would not have wanted to get into arguments with them. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it, all, it all affects the public ultimately, whether it's that's because your streets are unsafe or your kids buying dope from somebody who buys dope from the next level who eventually it trickles down from up and above in Miski's organization or someone else's organization. I'm looking at a case now from a few years ago where it, you know, at the bottom of the chain was a 17 year old high school student still in high school. And he'd been, he'd been working with someone uh, buying, buying drugs from someone who got it from somewhere in the Miski chain uh, for a year, and he was only 17 at the time. Um, and I'm told that's that's the chain that comes down in neighborhoods all over, at least all over Oahu, um, uh, that, uh, that kids get in trouble, kids squander their money and don't pay, kids get beaten up, kids get threatened, families get threatened, families get broken up. Um, I think we see the damage all over. Yeah. So, uh, Amazingly to me, um, the Miski's defense attorneys made an argument uh, that he should be out on bail. But one of the arguments was they, they took the murder that you thought was so troubling of his son's best friend. And they said, well, look, that doesn't show he's violent. That's a very special case. You know, you got to understand this is a father, a very special emotional case. That doesn't show he's dangerous generally. It just shows... <laughs> It basically just goes, you know, it got away from him in that case because of his son. <laughs> the, the court rejected the argument, um, but I thought that signaled what they'll try, what they're planned to try um, as one one layer of defense when this gets to court. Yeah, not all, not all first degree murders are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my last question for you, Ian, is uh, sure. Is, is the question out of Dustin Hoffman's Marathon Man, um, are, is it safe? Are we safe? Is he in jail? Is his Hydra, you know, <clears throat> tamped down, uh, in, in non-operating right now? Or are there elements of it that are still operating? Uh, is, is there any part of his enterprise that's still alive? I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are parts of it. Um, but now they're sort of uh, like the um, the Ronin samurai. They're leaderless. Um, uh, I'm sure there are also rival elements in organized crime who are glad to see him going down and are offering assistance where they can. Um, sure. You got to know that someone who's been ripping off other people's gambling games or other people's drug supply networks has made a lot of enemies along the way. So uh, uh, some of that I'm sure is in play as well. But are, are we any less safe than when it was all organized? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think people are probably laying low at this point in time. Mm. Well, it'll make a great movie on cable, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the question is only whether, whether the, the producer ha has to change the names. That's all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a heck of a story. Um, as I say, it's a window into the world we don't see normally. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's an education we need, you and I, and everybody else watching this. Yeah, very valuable discussion. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for covering it. Thank you for in advance for covering it in the future. And I hope you can come back from time to time and give us a precy on, on how it's going. Have no fear, I'll be here. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Ian Lynn, extraordinary investigative reporter in Hawaii, doing us all great service. Aloha. Thanks, Jay.